All right. Um, I think we're ready to uh, start the second uh, uh, faculty se second session on faculty presentations. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Yu Sun. Um, he's our guest today. He's an associate professor from uh, Cal State or Cal Poly Pomona, and he's going to actually talk to us about um, education, ed educational aspects of software engineering. So it'll be a little bit different from the other talks I gave. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks again for having me here. So my name is Yu Sam, uh, Faculty of Computer Science at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, I do research on software engineering, mostly on domain-specific modeling languages, model-driven engineering, a little bit model transformation. Uh, past two years, been working, working on more on the cloud computing and mobile computing. So uh, instead of talking uh, research, I probably want to talk, uh, share some of my experience recently on teaching and education. Um, so a uh, little bit background on our institution. I don't know how many of you actually know Cal Poly Pomona. It's one of the CSU campuses. Uh, it's almost like a one hour northeast from here. So uh, we are a Hispanic uh, serving institution. About 33% of students are Hispanic. Uh, some other minoritized students. A lot of first generation students. Another interesting uh, we see, I see actually from Cal Poly Pomona is that a lot of our students work uh, has some kind of part-time job. So obviously I'm not talk talking about um, you know, developer part-time jobs. So they mostly work in restaurants, warehouses, all these different kind of random jobs without um, having anything to do with computer science or coding. So that means they work really hard. A lot of students commute, they do work, study, work really hard, they're very independent, very mature. And then eventually what I actually found is most of our students actually, their number one goal is actually to graduate soon and then to go to work. So very few of them actually uh, choose to go to apply PhD or uh, grad schools. So that's actually very special in our um, uh, student group. That's why for them, you know, career funding jobs is really, really important. So for our faculties, actually we uh, take that as top priority. So for, uh, you know, we are a teaching more in school, even though we also do a lot of research, but you know, we always try to think about what can we do to help our students to improve their you know, performance in job market and finding jobs, right? So even though it's, it's, it's still a very good job market since I think in the past five or 10 years, it's really good, especially for computer science and programming. Uh, I think most of students face these challenges, especially the fresh graduate uh, students. Uh, for example, they, um, you know, they, they mostly just learn the primary languages. They don't have a lot of the, the technical skill set uh, used in, in the industry. And then also, you know, the majority of students don't have very strong internship experience. Now, we do have <coughs> students that did internship in Google, Microsoft, but those, not the majority. And also, uh, to our surprise, that a lot of students actually don't know much about the whole interview process. You know, for those of the students who have done the interview application, they know exactly what they need to prepare for the uh, tech positions. But for most students, actually, they don't know much, uh, even when they are in the senior years. So, uh, uh, just more examples as we saw what happened to students. For example, if you look at a lot of the students' resume, undergraduate students, you know, one of the sections very important is the uh, languages and skills, right? So every student can put Java, C++, or Python, but besides that, and you know, a lot of students just leave it empty, and then they may put Windows, they may put Linux, maybe they put you know, Microsoft Office, right? So, so those are the problems. You can't just show the resume with Windows Microsoft as a CS major. And also, I mentioned they don't, a lot of them, they don't have um, uh, internships, tech internships. They have a restaurant job, but you know, I don't think that's a really an impressive thing to put on a resume. Um, so instead, students might put, oh, I have done some course projects. Um, that's actually very common for all the students, but you know, course project, it's not something that employer would take it too seriously. Especially if you're just talking about some very basic undergraduate courses, such as the uh, destructive algorithms, or a lot of students actually like to include the courses they finish in the undergraduate study. Uh, I often told them, well, these are good topics to have, but that doesn't differentiate yourself at all because every CS major will have this list of courses. So these are challenges they're facing, and obviously this is a big problem to solve. It's, it's not about one course, but since I'm in the department, I teach a lot of the software engineering courses uh, for most upper division students in our department. It's a core course, and then mostly for the junior and seniors. So I've been thinking, okay, so how can we do a little bit help to 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 you know uh, 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 get their goals in terms of their careers? Uh, the the good thing. Um, 
I found was, you know, before I, I, I joined as a faculty, I actually spent a few years in the industry. Um, so I had some of the experience I think that might be helpful for the students. Um, you know, one part of the experience, I actually spent a little bit over one year in Amazon uh, to work as a software engineer. I was uh, working in this very interesting team called Amazon Silk. Now, I'm not sure how many of you actually heard about it. it, it we were building this web browser for the Kindle Fire tablets. As you see, it's a very, very special browser that used cloud computing to, to boost the performance. So that was a project. So I actually experienced all the typical IDRO software development in this high-tech big companies. So I pretty much very familiar with that process. You know, a lot of you already know. You know, today all the this tech company, the the uh, they, they use IDRO. Uh, you know, they focus on iterations. They they get very very really quickly um, on the requirement. They don't do a lot of formal requirement analysis. They they collect the feedback from from customers. They do a lot of customer discoveries, and then they know how to planning and prioritize the tasks and then move on really quickly with IDRO um, iteration and cycles. And for the developers, they you know every they pick the tasks and then focus on the design, coding, and, and more importantly testing and code reviews. And also the developer also do a lot of operations. They should know how to build, how to you know manage the environment and deployment, all of this stuff. And also as you work you know with the IDO team, there are a lot of meetings, pretty important for different purposes. And also at the end, you need to know how to release and manage your version, and, and also a lot of maintenance stuff. So these are the things I experienced. Well, for me when I I started teach software engineering course. Well, it's, it's just very straightforward to just integrate all those little steps and tools, you know, from the company to to the classroom. And also, you know, for me, uh, when I just started work, I realized that there was a big gap between uh, what we teach, what we learn from software engineering courses, and also the industry. I think now most of software engineering courses are much better, probably than 10 or 15 years ago. But I think for most of the courses back in 10 or 15 years ago, we probably focus more on series, on formal approaches, rather than some of these ideal or practical topics. So a lot of things for me, I, I, the, the, the ones I remember most was number one, like requirements, you know, from the textbook is such a great and important topic, but in reality, people don't do really much on requirement, at least for the this you know, internet companies, some of these uh, idle teams. And also, I don't see any teams actually use some of these formal tools, documentation tools, specifications to uh, really document their design or, or, or requirements. Everything is very informal. And then also, I never seen anyone using UML in some of the big company. I'm not saying none of those are used. For example, some of the class there one people use that for the design discussion. People use some of the very simple like actor views there ones to just talk about high level features. But you know, most of the time people don't use that anymore. But these are the things that I actually learned. So I realized, well, we probably need to change that. And also, most of the company today they focus a lot more on code. They, they, they highlight the code best practice, convention, and also also a lot of these clean code principles and um, you know uh, this this uh, topics. Uh, also in a company, I, I feel you know it's it's everyone try to focus on the prototypes, MVPs, and then try to move on with iterations. Uh, so because of that, when I designed the course, I just you know drop all those traditional series, just focus on the just like probably a lot of you are doing. And then also try to integrate as many training tools as we can. Uh, because in Amazon or Google, this company, they actually use a lot of the tools. They're really leading the software engineering development in the industry. Um, but a lot of tools is their internal tools. The good thing is today you can easily find alternatives from open source tools and then from, from the, you know, you can find equivalent tools for, for us to use at, you know, in the classroom. Uh, another thing we try to focus, uh, which is pretty common for software engineering course, is project. So uh, again, nothing special. However, I did learn a very good lesson uh, before I joined uh, as a faculty. So I spent a couple of years, also did a couple startup projects. We, we had startup companies. And then there was one big lesson I learned um, about what is called a good student project, right? So we all ask students to make a project in different courses. And then for students, there's nothing new, okay, they're very comfortable of making a project with a team or an individual, but what, what is a good student project? I didn't know that until I started to work on this startup company. So back in 2013, 
I work in this company called Parwork. It's co-founded by another uh, professor from Vanderbilt University. So what we did was a very cool technique that is, is a mobile AR. And today everyone knows what AR is, but back in 2012 and 13, that was very new. So we try to take a picture of any object and then we try to recognize the object and then we try to uh, uh, overlay some of the relevant content and information on top of those photos uh, just to give you a better way to retrieve the information. So for example, if you, uh, right here, if you see the middle of the picture right here, if you walk on the street and then you take a picture of this restaurant and shops and we can identify which restaurants and then we can return you some of the relevant information such as uh, reviews, maybe menus, some coupons, just to give you a better experience of retrieving information. So that was a tech project. Now, one of the co-founders um, and his name's John, he's one of my best friends, and uh, he was a PhD student at that time, well, I think back in 2012, uh, in Virginia Tech. So his research actually was computer vision, because for this whole AR project, most of the algorithms are in computer vision, some of the C++, OpenCV stuff. So he was the major developer that built most of the algorithms, so that's why he was also one of the co-founders of the company. So later on from him, I actually started to realize, wow, this is actually a very good model because as a PhD student, well, that was his PhD research topic, okay, this computer vision algorithms. And then he did that, he had to do that anyway because he, he needed that to graduate. And then he got the, all his results, obviously he has publications, but at the same time, you know, this technique is so useful, so they got a startup company. And then we actually got seed funding from one of the VCs. So that was actually very successful. Um, but the end of story of the startup company, it, it didn't really work out. Um, we, after one year, we ran a lot of fundings, and then people started working on that. So that startup wasn't successful. However, June actually found a job in Apple, and then he actually works as a research scientist in Apple's AR team. So from June, I actually realized, wow, this actually is such a good way to do research. You know, instead of just working on a project for your master or PhD research, you actually also benefits some extra startup opportunity, and also it's related with, with your career. Uh, so, so then I started to tell students, you know, when you make the project again, you really need to think about this is not just for you to finish a course, to for you to graduate, but more important, make sure somehow it can help your career. And also, if you're thinking about grad school, you know, maybe you can generate some publications, or you know, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, maybe you can also turn that project into a startup. So I try to highlight to students, well, it's, it's not we ask you to do four different things. Okay, you are still making this one single project. There's no actual work. The only difference is now, I want you to think a little bit bigger, make your project more practical, and then have a higher bar um, to, to really, you know, uh, make it really useful by, by, the, by the general users. So that, this is the requirement we have for the student project. So it's, it's a typical <coughs> team project. You know, for software engineering, it's better to have a team so that they can experience the challenges of working with a team on software development. And then we ask students to, to only work on a web service project. So today, a lot of students ask, oh, can I do a mobile app? The answer is no, because mobile app is relatively easier. It's, it's, a, it's not only just one environment, one kind of framework, one language. It's, it's relatively easy to do. You can't really experience all the challenges from software engineering point of view. So we ask everyone to do a web service, which means you have front-end, back-end uh, databases. You need to uh, most likely learn a lot of new frameworks, especially the front-end. That's something most students <coughs> never learn much. And then they need to know how to build, how to deploy, how to use some of these training tools, such as continuous integration. <coughs> they may need to use cloud computing to hold their services. So, so this web service is such a great <coughs> context for students to try all these um, uh, you know, trending tools and approaches. And then we don't really put any constraint on their ideas, but we highlight the, the, the point is you need to make sure your project is useful. You need to make sure you solve the problem. So we actually brought a lot of the uh, business, entrepreneurship, some of these very basic topics to, to, to educate students that, you know, make, instead of talking about technology, you know, start with a problem from your life. Okay, then, then derive, de develop some kind of project with that. And then later on, at the end of the semester, we ask every team to do a presentation. We want to make it as an like, investor pitch type of presentation to talk not just about the technical, but also uh, a lot of business side. And, and also eventually we make sure everyone actually publish the project, so I'll talk more about that. And then the course topics, if you ever do the course with IGO, pretty much I think it all looks similar. So we want to do for the first half or maybe one third, first one third of the uh, weeks, 
we try to go through the basic idle cycle, starting with the requirements, uh, you know, version control, talking about some of the basic web surface development, because most students actually never done that before. And we taught them how to build the software using some of the tools, and obviously we go through the actual practice and how to manage the different meetings, manage our project, and also briefly talk about the unit test and code review. And then around you know week 10 or maybe uh, the lesson 10, they need to start to really deploy their, their project to, to cloud. We mostly ask students to use AWS, some students maybe use Google Cloud, and then also we, t we ask students to use continuous integration to actually connect everything to make it an automated cycle. And so, so by the lesson 11, so they know how to do one complete idle cycle from their, their, their uh, issue and task to development to code review to deployment to deliver that to the user. So after that, they need to follow that cycle to keep going, keep going until they finish. And then we use the second half of the course just to talk about the regular software engineering topics such as design patterns, uh, clean code principles, some of the scalability techniques, and then we also try to introduce some of the trending tools. One of the major things we've been talking about and integrating is Docker containers. And then at the end, they do the, you know, they do the presentations. So we also spend one more week at the end to just focus on, on queries and job applications. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but that's also very helpful for the students. So the student base will work as a team to finish the project. At the end, obviously, most of the software recording, we, we don't do really the final exams. Uh, it's a reading exam, doesn't, it's not that useful. So we ask students to provide us three deliverables. Okay, so we ask them to give us three URLs. Well, number one, you need to give us URL to your GitHub repo. Number two, we want to see your presentation slides URL. But the more importantly, we want everyone to give us a public deployed domain name. It shouldn't be a, a regular like, EC2 domain name. You must purchase a domain name that costs them maybe $10 for that first year. Uh, but the reason is we want to make sure that they have something really nice and professional to write on a resume. Okay, I'll give you more examples later. So, with all of this, it definitely helps to address some of the challenges. Now, for example, I mentioned a lot of students don't have anything to write. It's actually not really students' fault because, you know, for, for most of the CS integrated programs, we're not going to spend much time to talk about JavaScript, talk about some other tool, like technical thing. They can pretty much pick up by themselves. Uh, but this course, by going through everything, they have to, you know, use all these tools and approaches. So, no matter how much they use, but they should feel f more comfortable to, to put all these tools by finishing this project with, with their, their teammates. So that's why we explicitly integrate all these little tools into their project, into the web service project, so that they can actually have something to write after the, the course. The experience, uh, we, we don't have internship for them, but you know this one is a course project. Instead of just talking about, oh, I have this course project, you know, they can provide a more professional startup type of project. So I'll give you a good example, you know, this group of students, they try to solve the problem how to do the, you know, uh, figure out the schedule, the best schedule for their courses. So they build a simple web service that allows you to input your desired day and time to come to campus to take the courses, and then the service automatically generate all the uh, possible schedule for you so that you can choose. And then um, they actually published the, the, the web, the, the, the application a few years ago. We got a domain name, Bronco Scheduler. Actually, it's very interesting. He told me actually the next quarter, during the peak uh, days in the first week of the quarter, they got over 2,000 visits per day just from Cal Poly Pomona. So that was a very successful project. And then this student, Isaac, right now is in Apple. So, you know, with this kind of project, now you can write your resume a little bit different. You know, instead of just talking about the course project, which most companies probably don't take it seriously. Now you can say, okay, I actually made this pr startup project with my teammates. And then it is, uh, it's this project solved this problem. Here is my URL, go ahead and check it. It's a .com domain. And then you, you want to see my source code, I have a link. And then my site has been, you know, have this peak traffic with over 2,000 visits per day. So if you write this kind of experience, definitely it's going to be more impressive and more convincing than, and, than just uh, putting a course project. So these are just some of the projects we have done in the past years. Uh, it, it's all team projects, they basically focus on problems. I don't have time to share a lot of this uh, project, but uh, we, we do have a lot of cool ideas over the past years. And then you can actually find most of their links online. 
And the last part, is this, this, you know, job application part, we just want to give them a little bit overview on, on what's going on, what you need to do. We spend maybe two lectures at the very end to tell them how the interview process works and then also what you need to prepare for, their, for your interview. And then we will highlight, well, the software engineering course will not help you directly to, to land the offer. You got to go back to your algorithm and data structure to practice those cool coding questions because that's what the company asks you. And then meanwhile, we actually asked a lot of the guest speakers to come back to, to talk. And then instead of getting the really the professional the expert, which you know very difficult to get, we actually got a lot of alumni back. The, the, the software engineering course alumni, they're mostly sometimes nearby in local companies, sometimes they flew from you know, Silicon Valley or Seattle uh, to give us a talk. The really helpful thing is these guest speakers, they were students just a couple years ago, and that actually gives students a very good model and motivation uh, for them to see, oh, actually, they can do that, I can also do that. This is pretty important for the student in CSU system because they actually, I can tell you, they often see, feel, well, I think Google maybe only one student from Berkeley, only one student from Stanford. You know, by seeing these models, definitely help to build their confidence. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, some of the quick experience I have to sh I want to share. But uh, thanks again. So we have time for one quick question. There's one. Yes. Does the university have any like workshops for the, especially for the interview um, skill pre preparation? Yeah, so a lot of those actually are organized by the clubs from the CS. Mm -hmm. And the career center, they, they just give general interview, which right. doesn't work for the CS majors. But a lot of, we, we start to see a lot of the clubs that do that because they invite the alumni, they invite the companies to be there. That's actually more useful and effective. I personally also try to talk some of those with, with my experience. And yeah. how many students do you have in this class? So our typical size is 35, but in the past two years, we do have large classes, sometimes 70, sometimes 80. So, but four or five students per, per team. So that's the <coughs> kind of size we have. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Yafar. Thanks. So our uh, next speaker is uh, Chao Wang. Uh, he's an associate professor at USC, and he's gonna talk to um, us about um, uh, validating cyber physical systems. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, while preparing this talk, I was wondering, um, what can I do to uh, make sure you, you remember my talk after, <laughs> after a, a few weeks, maybe a few years or something? Uh, uh, I was thinking maybe the most important thing is to uh, have a good motivating example. And then I came up with this example. I thought maybe you could remember this for the rest of your uh, lives. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me try. <laughs> You set the expectations very high. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just trying to get your attention. Now I have your attention. I can, I can get started. Um, so let's just imagine that you're a project manager and your team is developing this traffic light controller. I mean, how hard is this, right? You're just controlling these uh, three traffic lights. But I'm telling you, this is a, the future generation uh, traffic light controller. It's going to have a lot of uh, features. A lot of sensors, it's going to synchronize with all the other traffic light controllers uh, in the city. It may even use uh, AI techniques to optimize the traffic flow in you know, early morning, and get people quickly into the city, you know, late afternoon, and get people outside the, the city. What I'm trying to say is that this may be a very complex system, but it is, at the same time, you also have some kind of uh, properties you really want the system to satisfy. Uh, these are safety critical. For example, uh, the cross lights, uh, the, the green lights, should be should never be on simultaneously because it's going to kill people. Right? And um, because this is a complex system, let's assume that it's so complex, some, some, some parts of the code is not written by your, your team, and you cannot really do exhaustive testing or verification. Then what do you do? Right? You're the product manager. When the time comes, you're going to push it into the market. Right? But you always wonder, what if, right? what if something bad happened? Uh, today, what I want to talk about is, is an idea that, that may actually be able to uh, enforce uh, this type of critical properties at runtime with certainty. 
So at the high level, I view the big system as a reactive component that constantly takes some signals in and generates some signals out. And the, the behavior of the system uh, can be expressed in some kind of property. Uh, but we assume that you cannot uh, verify it. Uh, you cannot do existive testing. And what we want to do is to turn this property uh, into another component where you could put together with your original system. So in this case, even if the system sometimes malfunction and break this property, um, you can see this so-called shield is going to monitor the input and output. And if there is a violation, it's going to modify the output. So the original input and the modified output always going to satisfy your property no matter what. So the first question is, is this even possible? You know, what kind of property can be enforced in this way? So we want to figure that out. And the second thing is, suppose we identify a subset of such properties. How are we going to uh, design this shield? Right? So what we want to do really is not have a human design the shield, but from this specification <coughs> automatically generate the, the, the shield. So we started working on this uh, problem uh, about five years ago. And uh, once in a while, I have some students uh, helping me. So we're constantly making progress. A slow progress, but we started out with the Boolean domain and, and a set of simple safety properties, and we, we showed that this is possible. And then later on, we improved it to handle more and more complex uh, scenarios. And more recently, we, we started, uh, you know, applying this to several physical systems where the signals are not just Boolean signals, true or false, but also a real valued signals. So today, I, you know, in the next ten minutes, I hope to give you an overview. Uh, of, of, of this set of ideas. Let me start with uh, uh, this example uh, in a more concrete way. So the grand vision is to turn a bunch of properties that you cannot really prove into this safety shield, such that if you put it together with your system, uh, you would guarantee this property, uh, no matter what. Even if you pull water into your system, uh, the circuit start, you know, smoke coming out of the circuit, you still are able to uh, satisfy the property. Um, so let's say you have these two Boolean signals, uh, O1, O2, these are the two traffic lights. Uh, you can specify <coughs> properties in certain ways, for example, globally, not O1 and O2. So these two lights can never be on simultaneously. You can even specify Leibniz properties, for example, globally, if there is a pedestrian button being pushed, uh, that implies finally O1, so that's a liveness property, and this is in the other direction. You can even express some kind of fairness properties. For example, uh, O1 has to be on uh, once in a while, O2 has to be on once in a while. The classic way of doing things is you have a team develop this big uh, system, uh, but then you want to do testing, exhaustive testing or verification. You turn the property into uh, a monitor, and then you compose it together with a system you could you know, do testing or verification. Now, one particular method is called model checking, and you can fully prove. Uh, suppose that cannot be done. I mean, in this case, for some reason it cannot be done. Maybe the, the, the system is implemented by a third party, you don't have the source code. Or maybe it's, it's, it's actually a correct implementation, but it's being tampered or for, for whatever reason. You didn't prove this property. Right? What I want to do is, even if this big system is a black box, by turning this property into this shield, and you can see this, this is I1, I2, and the original O1, O2, and then the modified O1, uh, uh, O2 prime. So what I really want to have is a shield that if the D violates this property, uh, then I'm going to fix it. Otherwise, uh, the output will be the same as the original. Uh, this turned out to be feasible. This is actually just a one logic gate you could do this. This is an AND gate to input one output. This dot here is the negation. So let's assume that you have these two signals being 0, 0. It didn't violate this property. Then the output would still be 0, 0. If this is 0, 1, output will still be 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, uh, one 0. Only when the original output is 1, 1, uh, this would turn it into one zero. So this is a very, very simple case because it's an invariant. Uh, so you could definitely do this automatically. Uh, 
what I want to say is what kind of other properties? For example, if, if it's more complicated, it involves time, right? If this signal is on within three clock cycles, that signal is off. Is, is that property still, in, in, can it be enforced in this way? So we started working on this. Initially, we form, uh, formulated this problem into a two-player reachability game, or safety game. We are assuming that this is the system, this is the shield we want to generate. Uh, we assume that the system is a bad player. It may introduce arbitrary uh, faults into the system. But this is another player try to have some countermeasures. So we want to search for a winning strategy for this, this shield. If we find a strategy that, that is the implementation of the shield, so that's the high level idea. Um, so f to do this, we first need to specify what, what do we mean by correctness between the input and the modified output. And we also need to detect uh, violations uh, between the original input and the original output uh, of the system. We only make modification uh, to the output signals when there is a violation. And even in, in that case, we want to minimize the deviation uh, between these two uh, output signals. So at the very high level, this is basically, uh, you, you know, we turn the specification, safety critical specification, into a finite automaton. This can be just, you know, R is the request, S is the acknowledgement, something like that. If something goes wrong, you're going to the bad state. So starting from this type of safety specification, what we do is we would construct some correctness monitor basically from here. I will not go into details, but this is, a, 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 it, this is doable. And then we, we, we need to generate another monitor basically to detect violations. And the third one is when there is a violation, we need to define uh, the deviation because we have to make some modifications to the output. And this deviation is de defined by if the two signals, output signals, are the same, then there is no deviation. Otherwise, there is a de deviation one. It's Hamming distance. So when we compose <coughs> all three uh, monitors together, uh, then it's a big uh, bubble diagram. This is actually the, the game graph. It outlines all the possible moves the bad player, the system, can introduce violations, and all the possible counter moves uh, this shield uh, can do to, to, to try to uh, mitigate that. So if we statically solve this game and we uh, identify a winning strategy, basically says whatever you know, error you introduce, if we follow this strategy, we would always win. Then we would have the shield. So that's the idea. And actually solving this uh, safety game is, is, uh, is, is feasible. So there is a classic algorithm for doing that. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, uh, that's basically what we did initially. Uh, initially, and you can see here is an example. Uh, this is the safety specification. This is a bad state. Um, if the system introduces an error, this is a simulation trace. Uh, steps zero, one, two, three, and that's the input signal. These are the two outputs. Here, one one means there is a violation. The two uh, green lights are on at the same time. And we just synthesize this shield from this safety specification. And uh, if we attach that, you can see immediately it will, be, uh, it will be mitigated. And this is without delay, because beforehand, we already figured out the winning strategy. But in this work, there is a weakness, because we were so caught up in minimizing the size of the shield, the number of states. Uh, it cannot handle burst error. means. If there is a second a consecutive error uh, in the next time step, we can still mitigate it, but then we're tricked into a fail-safe state where, and you can see, we, even if the system recovers, uh, we're still trying to fix it, uh, which is not good. So we had a follow-up work where uh, we try to handle this, uh, this burst error. And now the, the shield becomes a little bit larger, but and you can see that in this case, as soon as the system gets back to normal, and we're not messing with the output anymore. <coughs> so we're constantly minimizing the deviation. And finally, uh, uh, you know, last year, we started looking at separate physical systems. Because uh, when we did the original work, we assumed the input and output signals are, are Boolean. They're either true or false, purely uh, digital. But then in real, uh, in real systems, 
uh, they are, you know, they, they can be real numbers, they can be integers. So we have to handle that. And there are some uh, technical issues there. For example, uh, you could easily convert this uh, uh, real value signal into Boolean, but uh, when you find a, a, a correction signal in the Boolean domain, when you try to convert it back to uh, real values, uh, sometimes it may not be feasible. Even though in the real domain, there is actually a feasible solution. So we, we tackled this problem and we have um, made some improvement, but I, I will not get into, into details um, for that. So we tried this out uh, on some um, uh, control systems. Um, there is, uh, for example, powertrain control, the diff autonomous driving, different, different kind of controllers. And uh, uh, we find that quite effective. So one of this uh, case study, for example, is from uh, automotive powertrain control. And uh, these are the simulation traces. Uh, there is some, uh, you know, safe region, unsafe region. For example, this is going out of the, the safe region. And when we attach the shield, it can actually uh, automatically uh, fix it. And this is a, the solid line. It's it, it, it is the fix. And and there is another example. Is the the autonomous driving where you have an ego car and then you had to have a, a, a adversarial. Uh, vehicle. Uh, if you don't do anything, I mean, they're, they're just going mm -hmm. constant speed, there, there will be some problems. But if you attach uh, a shield without fixing the control of these two cars, uh, it, it, it will be able to mitigate some of this. Uh, and you can see that uh, it changes the speed of one, the ego car and then it would avoid mm -hmm. this collision. And so this is for distance, uh, this is for velocity, and then this is for acceleration. So that's what I want to talk about. It's, it's, a, it's an idea, it's a little bit theoretical, and uh, it's, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, you know, pushing forward, making pro progress uh, you know, uh, year after year. But I welcome your, your suggestions <coughs> for, for this. I didn't talk about some, some of the other projects that are going on in, in our group, but. Uh, Two, two of my students are here, so if you're interested in talking to them. Uh, these are on unrelated projects. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Going to the example of the traffic lights. The way it is solved nowadays, you have localized control for the intersection. Then you also have coordination, which may be done based on some criteria timing, you might be to have a speed of the car going so that you hit green lights, also the amount of time for a given time of day. Then you have supervisory control, which is where the city has its own cameras and can intervene and change the operation of the respective flight. <coughs> We've all left what ideas, apart from that you have issue of the cybersecurity, but let's put this aside. Just let's say it's safe for now. What ideas from existing solutions did you incorporate in this example? And then a general case, again, problem is known in the critical safety type of application, process control system, and then you have safety system on top of that. And then the additional system that in the physical world you have in order to mitigate some failure, say, an explosion in a chemical plant. What knowledge from body of knowledge in this area did you bring in and incorporate into your investigation? That's a great question. So the main, um uh, literature that uh, I reviewed while I was doing this work is from the supervised control. There, in 1989, there was some seminal work on that, and simultaneously, there, there's some other work uh, in formal methods. There are uh, two different type of uh, papers, but they are actually on the same topic. So it's pulling from that uh, angle, but there is a big difference. Uh, in supervised control, they're trying to synthesize the, the controller. Here, we are assuming that I can afford to lose functionality of the traffic light controller. I can cause traffic jam, that's fine. Uh, I don't want all green lights to be on. And that is the cru crucial difference. Because if I want to repair the whole <coughs> controller, the whole functionality, um, I personally don't believe that, that that is possible. 
but but I can fix this critical property itself. Traffic jam is fine. All, uh, all red lights uh, are fine. All green lights are not accepted. So I, that's. But going back to the shield, shield is equivalent in a chemical plant or a nuclear plant. Your safety system, which is independent from your process control. And not only that, you may have a failure of the shield. So that's yeah. why you use redundant, well, to use the, the shield, triple redundant or redundant with uh, uh, checking and things of that nature. Right. I, th that's another great question. So I had an advertisement slide, but I didn't include it here. <laughs> so usually, for example, you would try to harden the design in a, in a harsh environment. You either harden the entire system, which is going to be very expensive, but the shield is, by design, going to be very small. So if we just harden the shield, it's much cheaper. Uh, like I said at the very beginning, I tried to be provocative. I said, for the system part, even if you uh, pull out the hammer, you smash it, or you pull the water in it, if the shield is hardened, it is still fine. You lose all the functionality, but the safety is guaranteed. So in the interest of keeping up with time, uh, let's thank Chao one more time. I think the speakers are going to be around during the break, so there will be more time for discussions. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Jim Jones. He's an associate professor at UCI in the informatics department, and he is going to tell us about, um, I guess, uh, debugging and uh, bug localization, or something along those lines. <laughs> Let's see. So it's showing here. Please push this. Please push this. Uh, thank you, Sam. So today I'm going to talk about our work on um, bug report aggregation and summarization, particularly for mobile applications. This is work that um, we published last year, both at the International Conference on Software Engineering, ICSI, and at the International uh, Symposium on Software Testing and Analysis. Um, this is work that I did with my students, um, Ri Hao and Yang Fang. Um, neither of them are here with me, unfortunately. Um, Ri was a visiting PhD student from Nanjing University, and she's done her year of study abroad and has since returned. And Yang Fang, just last month, um, defended his dissertation and started an assistant professor position at Nanjing University. Um, so I just want to credit them with, with uh, working with me on this, on this project. So the problem we have is that for in bug reporting systems, we typically have high duplicates, uh, a high number of duplicates that are being submitted for uh, our bug reports. Um, and inspecting these are, is a really time consuming uh, task to, to go through all, all of them. And typically, um, looking at submitting duplicates and reviewing duplicates are seen as, as a wasteful activity. In fact, it's often discouraged for the users to submit duplicates. Like you're encouraged to make sure that you're not submitting something that the, they, the developers already know about. And in fact, this problem only gets worse with the, the current um, wave of crowdsource testing. There's a number of companies that do crowdsource testing that promote that. And in fact, we see that <coughs> And the blue bars here show the duplicate ratio um, for a number of different software projects. And uh, here we have the orange bars are the duplicate ratios for crowdsourced um, uh, projects. So we see even higher, even worse, um, dupli uh, duplicate ratios for when you do crowdsourcing. But nevertheless, whether you do crowdsourcing or not, um, duplicates can be a problem in terms of resources. Um, the current solutions to handling this are you know, either manual or automatic. And in, you know, in practice, what's done is, is more of a manual uh, approach, where you know, someone or a team of people are going through the submitted bug reports, and they're looking to see if, something is ar if, if someone's already <coughs> submitted that bug report. And that's either using their knowledge and experience from reading past bug reports, or doing keyword searches, and you're saying, uh, I kind of remember somebody submitting a bug uh, about the login page or something like that, and you, you search and you try to find 
uh, the those the original bug report <coughs> and then mark this new one as a duplicate. Um, in the research, there have been techniques that do clustering, so it's doing automatic duplicate detection um, based upon mostly based upon the words that are in the the bug report descriptions. Um, and there's some work that use execution traces. Um, and then there's other works that that um, seek to automatically prevent duplicate from being uh, submitted at all. So it, it you know, does some uh, matching and says, ah, I think somebody else has already submitted this, so we're just going to stop you right there. Don't bother submitting your bug report. Um, and then when we apply this, I, this, this, you know, when we look at specifically the mobile uh, app um, domain, um, there's a paper that Zhang et al. Uh, published um, uh, called Bug Reports for Desktop Software and Mobile Apps in GitHub. What is the difference? And what they found, um, not surprisingly, was that uh, for mobile apps, people tended to submit way less text and much more screenshots. And if you think about it, it's not surprising how hard it is to type out a long description of what's going on on your phone, but it's so easy to just to take screenshots. Um, so we want to address that problem, and, and indeed, using some of the traditional approaches for mobile can be problematic because we don't have a lot of text often. Um, so with this work, we wanted to question this fundamental assumption. Our duplicates are really so wasteful um, and useless. Um, a couple uh, studies, Zimmerman et al. and Bettenberg et al., um, Zimmerman looked at uh, bug reports and tried to identify what makes good bug, bug reports. And, and what they found was mo most bug reports actually are lacking key information to reproduce the, um, the failures and to you know, successfully diagnose what's going wrong. And then Bettenberg um, had this paper, uh, duplicate bug reports considered harmful. I thought that really, um, and they found that like in duplicates, you actually do see a lot. You know, if you can look at multiple duplicates, you're going to find a little bit of extra information that might be useful for you. Um, so our solution is uh, a prototype bug reporting tool that in, that we hope can, will encourage testers to submit bug reports regardless of whether that's a duplicate or not. Like, don't you know. Don't be shamed because you're submitting something that has already been submitted. Um, and then we'll take care of the problem of automatically detecting the duplicate reports based on both the text and based upon those screenshots that people are tending to upload for mobile apps. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll create a summarization of the group of all of the duplicates uh, to provide a comprehensive and um, comprehensible report for the whole group. So our technical approach here, I'm going to just summarize it in, in the sake, you know, for the sake of time um, with kind of a, a simple image. And I'll, I'll go through each portion here. Um, we have a number of bug reports that you know, are being submitted. And we, we look at the text and the screenshots. Um, the text, for the text portion, we just use the, um, the approaches that past researchers have done where we, we basically we take the words, we normalize them to remove verb tense and pluralization and capitalization. We normalize them so that we can match them across bug reports and we can determine similarity between all of our bug reports. For the images though, we use a technique from the computer vision domain um, called uh, spatial pyramid matching. And what, it, what that technique does is it looks at the images and it looks for features with them, some sub-features, and it tries to find similar features across um, images. And it turns out for, particularly for mobile apps, um, doing this kind of approach works really well because you don't have the same problems that you have on a desktop where you have you know, windows that can be sized in any kind of different way, and you have overlapping windows, and you know, all of the problems that you have with, with um, desktops. With, you know, mobile, you're much more constrained. You know, even if you have different device sizes, they tend to be the same kind of portrait orientation, and you have much more uniformity there. So we have much better chance of matching up um, these views. Um, 
And then what we do is we, we, um, we take these distance measures that are individual, we create a unified uh, distance measure, and then we apply a technique called uh, hierarchical agglomerative clustering to create, to find clusters of bug reports that look similar enough that we're going to say, okay, that might be a duplicate group. Once we've aggregated and we've created these clusters, then what we want to do is we find, want to find something that we're calling a master report. We are looking for one bug report that does the, what we hope to be the best job of summarizing what this whole group of duplicates is. Um, we do that by creating a graph of all of the bug reports within a cluster, and we, you know, we're drawing edges based upon the similarities among them, and we, we provide a weight for how similar they are. And then we apply a modified page rank um, algorithm to find the bug report that has the mo that's most informative and most representative of that group. Um, then with all of the other bug reports, the ones that are not the master report, then we want to, then we subcluster them because each of them, sometimes a subset of those mention some extra detail that weren't addressed in the master report. And so we, we do have some subclustering of those um, so that we can highlight those kind of, you know, different uh, features in, those, in that cluster. Um, we then do some content extraction. So we do some summarization techniques to try to pull out the most relevant sentences from these, these subclusters, which we're calling supplementaries. Um, so we just want to try to provide some snippets for those supplementary groups of bug reports to just represent what those are. And then we have a web view, which I'll show here in more detail. So in our prototype bug reporting tool, we represent information about the, the group of bug reports rather than just having a page per each bug report. Um, and you know, here we have our, our <coughs> master report with its screenshots. And each of these things can be clicked on and you can drill in to get more details. We have all of the um, testers who submitted bug reports that contribute to this, um, this bug report cluster. And we also have the, our supplementaries, where each of these represents a subgroup of duplicate bug reports. And we highlight the information that comes to that supplementary group um, addresses that's unique from the master. And then each of these can be clicked on, and then you can see the constituent bug reports, and you can read through those in detail. Um, we also have like kind of a, the, the overview of our dashboard of all of our duplicate report groups. <clears throat> and, and here you can see you know, some kind of overview information, some information about the master report. And we also implemented a feature that does automatic developer assignment to, so that it can look at historical bug reports and see, oh, when you have a bug report that's, you know, mentions these words like login or password or something like that, that typically went to um, John. And so it can automatically do an assignment for that developer. Um, and it's also interactive. So like some of them, if it has, you know, these ones here that were not automatically assigned, you can assign it manually, and then it can say, oh, okay, so I see now I understand more about how you want to assign things, and then it can try again and do some more automatic assignment. Um, we performed uh, in a, an evaluation um, on 12 mobile apps with over 5,000 bug reports. We had 5,600 um, bug reports um, that we used. You can see there's almost 8,000 screenshots. So these bug reports have, you know, on average, more than one screenshot that's um, attached to them. So we evaluated the aggregator um, to see how well it did when we're using um, the images and the text to see whether it, whether the images actually helped at all. Like, did, did we do a better job by looking at the images? than simply looking at text, which is the way that past researchers have done it. Um, the, the first um, row here is our, um, our prototype tool. Um, and we're using a, a V measure, which is um, um, it's a, it's a measure, it's an aggregate metric 
um, for clustering that incorporates um, completeness and homogeneity of the constituent of the of the members of the clusters. Um, but basically what you need to know is um, it, it, it's basically accuracy. So the higher the value, the better. Um, and I've bolded the best score for each of the, of the applications that we studied. And you can see that for all except for one, um, our hybrid approach worked best. So it worked better than just looking at text alone or images alone. Um, so, we also did a user study. So we, we assigned tasks to, um, to our participants. We had 30 master students that performed tasks based upon the summaries. And, um, you know, without going into too much detail, um, we looked at both com completion time for the task and their accuracy and how they performed their tasks. We found that <coughs> the, 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 the biggest difference between having the summarization view, the, I should say the control group was simply having the bug reports individually without having kind of the summarized view with all of the uh, automatic duplicate detection. Um, the main thing that we find here is that they, we, re, we reduced the time that it took them to do the task. Um, and we didn't reduce the accuracy, in fact we <coughs> We marginally improved the accuracy. Um, it's not statistically significant on the accuracy part, but at least we know we didn't harm accuracy and we improved the, the time that it took people to um, perform the tasks. So just to wrap up, um, we hope that you know, with, with you know, tools like this, we can encourage testers um, and users to submit bug reports regardless of, uh, of whether or not it's a duplicate and to be shamed if they submit a duplicate or to be discouraged when you submit a duplicate and it just marked duplicate and then it never it receives any attention, um, which has happened to me and I'm sure it's happened to you all too. Um, it's not a good feeling. And so we want to encourage that and if you need, by putting it into like a summarization of like now you're part of a community of people who are all working on you know, who have all submitted this. And you can see, oh, I can see all the comments and the, the tracking on that group of bug reports. Um, feature bug report, reporting tools and issue trackers um, might, you know, automatically aggregate and summarize duplicate bug reports. And we hope that developers can benefit from the wealth of information provided by all of the duplicates in, uh, in this summary. Um, so with that, um, Happy to take any of your questions. We have time for a couple of questions. Did you investigate on what was the cause of the outlier in the text yeah. that actually outreport? Um, was there something specific for that case? Or is it just that you found something they didn't expect? Okay, my, good question. My recollection of this, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think back to when I was having, if I had the, my students here, I would ask them, I would ask for that. But, but my recollection from sitting, I remember asking that question, I'm pretty sure that that application was one where um, it, it was an image editor. So the content of, of the activity view was largely the user. So similarities between different bug reports that were submitted, or the images that were submitted, wasn't helpful because it was mostly like, it was, you know, confounding. Yeah. Right, because of the context. That's the exception. That's why yeah. text was better because the description had too much. Exactly, yeah. That's my recollection at least. Okay, so follow up question. Is there a mechanism that you envision to give you choice and say, if I'm getting that outlier, send it to the text, uh, but in general, go to hybrid. Well, okay, so I mean, I would imagine, so, sure, it, it, I, what I would think is, you know, it, as the man, you know, as the person who's, you know, the developer of a project, you would know that you have an application that is, you know, con user content driven. And so you would maybe configure your bug reporting tool to only use the, the text. 
Or maybe if you got even smarter, you could say, if it's this activity view, the one that has the user content in it, don't apply the image. Um, but on maybe on the setting screens and other things like that, do apply it there. You, we could do something like that, perhaps. Any other questions? Comments?